Hi, I'm Congresswoman Terry Sewell of Alabama's 7th Congressional District. Welcome to our first Terry Talk of the year. As we begin the new year, we find ourselves at yet another great inflection point in our nation's history, where the future of our lives and our livelihoods hang in the balance. Almost six decades ago, John Lewis and so many known and unknown foot soldiers of the voting rights and civil rights movement marched fought, bled on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in my hometown of Selma for the equal right of all Americans to vote. Their efforts culminated in the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the most consequential civil rights law of our time that for decades has kept the promise of our democracy alive. Now, after the disastrous 2013 Supreme Court decision in Shelby versus Holder, we're witnessing the most concerted effort to restrict the right to vote in generations. Never did I think that the cause for which John Lewis and Amelia Boynton Robinson and Reverend F.D. Reese and so many others fought, marched, and bled right from our district. It goes to show you that progress is elusive and each generation must fight and fight again to preserve the progress of the past and to advance it. The House of Representatives had done just that. I'm proud to be the key sponsor of the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act which I introduced for the last eight years. It has passed the House of Representatives and it sits on the Senate side waiting for a debate. Just yesterday, we passed yet again, the Freedom to Vote John Robert Lewis Act and sent it over to the senators. So this legislation will go to the floor and it must pass. As President Biden said in his very powerful speech in Atlanta this week, history will judge each senator for what they have done at this critical moment. Will they choose to up, uphold the legacy of the foot soldiers or will they share it, or will they um, choose to enable the erosion of our democracy at the hands of those who have always sought to silence us? In three days, we will be joined together to honor the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King and the sacrifices that he and so many others have made in the name of fairness and dignity for all. May we continue to let the words of Dr. King inspire us, but let us also know the power of our own voice. Let us mobilize and organize and make sure that our senators know that now is the time to ensure the full protections of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It is my pleasure to be joined by fellow Selmian, Latasha Brown, the co-founder of the Black Voters Matters Fund. She is an award-winning, organizer, a political strategist, tactician. Latasha, thank you so much for being here to share your insight and joining me to discuss this urgent moment in the fight to protect the sacred right to vote as we approach Martin Luther King's Day. How are you, my sister? I am well. I am well. I'm happy to be here with you. Um, I think that this moment, while extremely challenging, I think it creates a major opportunity for us. And so I'm, I'm happy to be in this discussion with you. Well, let me just say, uh, to frame the discussion, I think everybody in America knows <laughs> now uh, that uh, two Democratic senators have said that they uh, will not vote in favor of changing the rules of the Senate to allow the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act to come to the floor for a vote. And what's most disheartening about this, aside from the fact that they're fellow Democrats, is the fact that both of them have said that they absolutely support uh, the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Act. And likewise, Senator Manchin is the co-author of the Freedom to Vote Act. Um, so the fact is that they support both pieces of legislation, but will not change procedural rules to allow for those bills to get to the desk of the president. Can you tell me what your thoughts are in this moment as an activist, but also as a person like myself who grew up in Selma, literally, um, you know, at the feet of all these people that people read about in, the mag in, in history books, you and I got to witness their everyday lives. I mean, mm -hmm. Reverend Reese was my, um, was my principal, uh, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, Cheyenne Webb uh, across okay. Priceburg was my babysitter. Um, and so, you know, I know that voting rights is personal for both of us. But at mm -hmm. this moment, tell me how you're feeling. And most importantly, tell us what we can do, what my constituents can do, what I as a legislator can do, what you're going to do 
as an activist? You know, I am feeling all kinds of emotions. Let me say, I wish I could say I'm feeling, you know, the fact that we're in 2022 and we're at this moment and, and on the weekend of celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King and the legacy of the voting rights movement. Here it is that we're fighting for voting rights. And then there are two Democratic senators that are essentially saying that they care more about their own power, right, than they care about the power of people. And so that is extremely disheartening, right? It's also disheartening that 16 Republicans that actually supported um, voting rights in the past now don't support voting rights. Like, what is the shift? What has happened? It has also appeared a time that as we are looking at the celebration of this weekend, there are organizers on the ground right now in, the, in Georgia that we have a part of our organization that are in Lincoln County, Georgia, that are organizing against an effort led by Republicans in that county to shut every single polling site with the exception of one, in a county that public transportation is not available, in a county that has a 30% African-American population. We're in a moment right now that we're seeing voting rights suppression laws pop up all over the country. And so I think it tells me a couple, a, a couple of things. One, I think it tells us that we have to stop and pay attention to what moment that we're in. First thing is we got to really know what moment we're in. We also have to recognize this isn't just a, a policy piece. This is just about okay, we've got to win this vote and then everything will be fine. No, this is around, we've got to have substantial structural change in this country. That what we're seeing right now, we have a system that is not lending itself for the fullness of democracy as it is even laid out in the constitution. That at the very least, I don't care where you are, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat or Libertarian, Green Party, it doesn't matter. You should have equal and fair access to the ballot. And so we have to recognize this is not a partisan issue, right? But what in fact it has turned into is it's been weaponized. There have been those who've been in power. And I talk about this uh, constantly, uh, Congresswoman Sewell, as you talked about many of those people, we actually had the opportunity to be trained and hear the stories. And I remember Reverend James Orange, who was one of um, of one of my mentors, and 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 we know n both knew him very well. You know, if we look at the strategy that is happening now. It is the same exact strategy. It's the same playbook. There's always been three kind of core ways that they've approached this. One, it has been one restricting access to the ballot. That was the whole piece of the Voting Rights Act in the first place, of restricting, creating a poll tax, making it challenging for people, uh, denying them the right to be able to register to vote, or making it harder for them to vote. It was like, oh no, it was the same argument we're having now. Well, uh, uh, ID, what difference does it make? Do you know that was the same argument that folks said, well, just ask, just say the preamble of the Constitution. You can register. You just need to tell me how many um, jelly beans are in this jar. That's it, right? And it's to create these subtle barriers that one on the surface you're saying, oh, that isn't the intent, but we know what the intent is, right? The second piece is really what we've seen is creating a culture of fear. That part of what what we saw happen in, from in the gym in 1965 is creating this culture of fear. That is part of what we saw in Georgia in the SB 202 where literally that this component that says that when people criminalize organizations that are actually helping to give comfort care to people that are standing in line right now, you're going to make, you're going to create, you're going to make, you're going to make those organizations that are trying to serve at democracy, you're going to make them criminals. Right. And then the third piece is weaponizing administrative process that what we're seeing in Georgia, what we're seeing in Texas, what we're seeing all across this country it's really when we're saying like, well, it's a law now, it's legal. Well, just because it's a law and it's legal doesn't make it right. At one point, slavery was legal in this country. That didn't make it right. But at, at, at the end of the day, that anytime we're using, we have to just, we just have to boil this down to anytime because the way that people voted, either who they voted for or how they voted, that they are punished because of how they voted, that that in itself is the very definition of political corruption. And so we have to recognize that's how democracies are unraveled and how they die. And so in this moment, what I am feeling, I'm feeling the anger, the sadness, the fear, all of those things associated with, here it is in 2022, and we're literally in many ways reliving this same fight, right? But let me say on the flip side of that, which I call the good news is, you know, what actually gives me hope in this moment 
is actually looking at the past as well. What gives me hope in this moment, I've been talking about this all week, what gives me hope in this moment, those 600 people that were on the Emma Pettis Bridge, that those folks in Selma, Alabama, that didn't have politics on their side, matter of fact, they were fighting the Republicans and the Dixocrats, right? They didn't have a lot of political capital. They didn't have the positioning, right? But in fact, because they had principle and they believed in what they were doing and they had a vision, they changed the course of history. And I am saying that right now that is being asked of us. That on some level, yes, the president has a responsibility. Congress has a responsibility and we have to hold them accountable into the fire. But we also have a responsibility. What I am sure of is if democracy is to take place and to be real in this country, we, the people, are going to have to make sure that it is real. We're going to have to make it be real. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I share your frustrations. I, I, I don't think that anyone um, who grows up really keenly aware of the fight and what the sacrifices that were made in order for us to have the right to vote. And I also know, like you just laid out, that voting rights used to be a bipartisan issue. In fact, what people forget is that the Voting Rights Act of 65 was reauthorized five times under four Republican presidents, most recently George W. Bush. And as you know, when we, uh, when we commemorated the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March, President Obama and Mrs. Obama was there, but so was George and Laura Bush. And mm -hmm. we've come so far from that. Uh, and it just goes to show us all that progress is truly elusive. The pendulum does swing. And I agree with you, even though I'm frustrated, my, I'm actually, I, I, I'm just mad. I'm, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I can't even, I can't even put words into, because to be here in Washington, uh, you know, I know that change rarely comes in the halls of Congress uh, by itself. Instead, change comes from activists like yourself on the grounds demanding that we make change. And so I, I, I'm trying to find some some comfort in knowing that our that the past that they had it far worse than we did. And yet they had faith, yet they that, you know, yet they were uh, intent on knowing that they were going to be on the right side of history and and they made it happen. I mean, they, they just created the circumstance that made it happen. And so um, I want to just talk about Black Voters uh, Matter, uh, your fund. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and how you are more mobilizing and organizing and let folks know how they can also join in that effort? Um, a, little later, a little later on, I'm going to actually put up on the screen the number for the Senate, the U.S. Senate. To Absolutely. I want my constituents to call our senators. And That's if right. you are listening, uh, I want, especially if you're from Arizona and you're from <laughs> uh, West Virginia, please call your senators and let your voice be heard. Um, but mm -hmm. aside from that, I also know that there's some great organizations like your own that are leading the good fight, leading the good fight. How can we help? You know, I, I, I want people to um, I want people to take a moment and be reflective this week in um, this MLK weekend. I want us not to approach this the traditional way of I mean, one, we want to celebrate what the people what people have have done in the past. We want to celebrate the legacy that we're all living in. But I also want to ask. Um, I, I want people to think about where they are in this moment in time. This is our moment. This is our civil rights moment, I believe, in my lifetime, right? I don't think that this is just about a bill. I think this is literally around we're in a political defining moment. And I think a part of what we have to recognize that there's been a paradigm shift, even the way that we see partisan politics. We're, you know, part of the reason that we're saying, well, we had members of other parties, that I think what we're seeing now is total collapse of the Republican Party. It's turned into a cult. And it turned into a cult of personality. And now it's turned into a cult of power grabbing. And so it's a party that has decided that, that this, the difference is not based on political ideology or difference of political ide ideology. It's a party that has decided that they're going to use the tools of fear, of, of, of divisiveness, of, of, of obstruction, and to power grab. That at the at the end of the day, that they would create a context for them to cheat, and we're gonna have to call it out. It's yeah. not a matter. This isn't the 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 the, the traditional way that we're used to, to to probably even seeing politics in itself work. But if we were to even go back to where there was at least a a a, a normal or at least a general power structure, the truth of the matter is, democracy as it's been laid out in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence has never been realized. That's there right. Are elements That's of right. It. 
Right. There's right. Elements. I mean, as they say, it, in, in order to form a more perfect union, we That's are right. still in this process. And what we know from history is that uh, change has come when people demand it. When that's ordinary right. Americans decide to do the, the most impossible, that's, um, right. that's when we've seen social and political change. And Absolutely. you know what? We need it now more than ever. And so talk to us about the voting, uh, the voting, the Black Voters Matter. So our organization in that, I'm, I'm raising that because I want people to really understand. Part of our organization was about, it's twofold. It was one around doing the work that is needed and necessary in this particular moment, right? And so in this moment, at Black Voters Matter, part of what we created the Black Voters Matter Fund is because what we felt is that we needed to create an organization that would actually help build out the ecosystem of Black grassroots groups that are on the ground. Because that's where what's change going? happens. And what would what do we do? We actually invest in those groups and support to build the capacity of those organizations. Last year alone, we were able to support and invest in over 600 Black-led groups, $10 million, where we literally wrote those checks to them directly in addition to supporting them. The second thing is really in terms of being able to lift up really this context of people to even see when you're talking about changing power, it's not just about changing the minds of people in power. Really, I, I just talked about this earlier on something I did for Harvard. It's really around the biggest context is getting people to change their own relationship with power and how they see themselves as, right. as people of power. And so part of our work of what we're doing is getting our communities to believe that not only we should have, but we deserve power, yeah. right? And really to be able to act in that power, I use our collective voices to recognize when we work together, we win. And then the third thing that we do in this process is really is right to keep the pressure on that we know that if in, that a part of democracy working requires accountability. And so what we have is we created a we had a a freedom tour that we did in 11 places, um, 10 states and in D.C. Um, earlier last year. Since that time, we've been doing ongoing. It's kind of been, I say, three ways that we've been organizing. We've been organizing in the streets, doing work with grassroots groups, helping them build their capacity, creating actions, education around that. We also have been organizing in the courts. We've been filed. We filed federal lawsuits, local lawsuits. We have several lawsuits filed. Um, I'm pending right now in Georgia, um, in Florida, there's a legal at the end. And then the third thing that we've been doing is really being able, which I think is really important and significant, is to get people to think beyond what they see now, to get people to radically reimagine what is possible. And so I usually ask this question where I go, I ask people to close their eyes and I ask them, what would America look like without racism? What would America look like if she truly were a democracy as it's laid out in the Declaration of Independence. When we're talking about every single human being has access to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, what does that America look like? And so I'm raising that because I also think that part of what we have to do in the short term is yes, we've got to reduce the harm that is happening, but we also are gonna have to be honest and recognize the political system and infrastructure that we have right now will not lend itself to pluralism. That the political structure that we have right now will not lend itself to the kind of democracy that every citizen in this country can have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that we're gonna have to be, we need something that is more inclusive, that is more equitable, and that is more just and that we need a representative government that when you look at the Senate, the Senate does not look like America, right? It is not reflective of the demographics of this nation. And we've got to make sure that we're creating a new framework, a new vision and see ourselves, not just as I think citizens of uh, citizens of this nation, we have to start seeing our, ourselves as founders of a new America. I love it. Listen, I, I, I couldn't uh, agree with you more. I think that that is so true. I think that this nation um, is... Uh, well, first of all, democracy is under attack, not just under voting rights. I mean, just That's think right. about January 6th um, and the literally uh, the efforts to literally overthrow government and overthrow an election. Uh, we would have never thought that that would ever happen in a democracy, let alone in this democracy. And um, so I, what can folks do? Like, I, I, I know for a fact that that calling your senators matters. And I want you to call um, the senators, uh, Alabama senators, but also, um, you know, to the extent that you have friends and family members that live in Arizona and West Virginia, you know, nothing uh, makes a member of Congress move more than to hear from their constituents right. and um, their own constituents. So below you will see the number uh, for the Senate uh, Capitol, for the Capitol uh, operator, 202-224. 3121. That's 
3121. Uh, we definitely want you to do that. Now, uh, Latasha, tell me what we should be doing for Martin Luther King Day. I mean, you know, it's a day of action. Uh, we are, you know, not, uh, Chuck Schumer just announced, Senator Schumer just announced that they're going to start debating on these bills, not Monday, uh, but Tuesday. Um, but still, we, we're we going to have opportunities all across America during this uh, MLK Day. And so, you know, tell us what we should be doing. So I think that this is a matter. I'm just going to say this weekend, I think right now we should, we need all hands on deck. And I think there's a number, I think, I think there are four things I think. I think we, this is the moment that our voices, there's a, uh, the National Negro Anthem, right, with, with which both um, Terry and I know very well, is the title of is Lift Every Voice and Sing. And so I want to focus on the Lift Every Voice. I want to talk, talk about the singing part, but I want to focus on the Lift Every Voice. If there's any a time that silence is not, is, is, is just not feasible, it's not necessary, it's not needed in a moment, it's now. And so there are many ways that people show up. Some Everybody's not going to be an activist, and that's okay. But you do have power. So there's many things that I think, there are four things I think you can do. The first one I want to reiterate to you, we should be clogging up the Senate number. We should be calling the Senate line 202-224-3121. Every time you think about it, every time you get mad about it, every time you think about Dr. King, you just need to call it. You just need to keep calling that number, right? But there also, if you look at the local numbers for, for, for Senator Cinema. And her office is, if she has an office in Tucson, she has an office in Phoenix and um, um, and Senator Manchin. You need to make sure that you also go to their website, leave a comment, let them know how upset you are. Go on Twitter, leave a comment, let them know what you expect them to do. And so I think that there are ways that we can do to apply pressure on them that's directed at them. But I also don't think we need to let the Republicans off the hook. I was that. Possibility. Let our uh, Senator uh, Tupperville and that's Shelby right. off the hook. Because Shelby was that's one of those 16 senators that voted for the reauthorization right. in 2006. That's so right. Let, it's not just mobilizing against our own, but also making sure that the Republicans know that they're on the hook too. They're on the hook too. That at the end of the day, we have to apply pressure all around all around we we should you should be calling their offices as well whoever your center at right now you should they should be hearing from you no matter where you live right and so certainly in alabama certainly in alabama tuberville and shelby need to be getting a call that we should be shutting their office lines down right now the second thing though i think is we need to recognize that we're in a long-term struggle that while we want this cup that we want this legislation right now that we know that we're in a long-term protracted struggle and in order to do that there are organizations that are on the front lines that are doing this every single day that find a political home, an organization that's doing the work. It doesn't matter, you know, whether it's the NAACP, whether it's our organization, whether it's a League of Women Voters, but write a check, whether it's $10, whether it's $20, you would be amazed at not just about the money. Sometimes it's not the money that makes a difference. It is the intention. Like that when you're seeing that people are standing with you, that they are creating. I also want to say those senators and those representatives, and I'm going to call you out right now, Representative Sewell, who have the courage to stand in the gap and represent us. We got to tell them thank you too. We got to let them, we got to gird them up. We know you get tired. I'm tired, but you fighting on the inside. I'm fighting on the outside, but it's hard on the inside. So I think we also have it's to make hard on the inside. That's all I can say. <laughs> But we also have to make sure that I run for my life to represent my home district. But never did I ever think that if I got to Congress that I would that the cause for which John Lewis and the folks back home struggled for would become our cause, too. But that goes to what you said. Progress is three steps forward, That's four right. steps back. That's Progress right. is seven steps forward, two steps back. That's right. We we every generation, as uh, as as uh, John would say, you know, fighting for voting rights is not a once, uh, once in a, a year, once in a month, once in, it's a once in a lifetime. It's like all the time we have to, every generation has to fight to maintain the gains. I mean, who would have ever thought we would still be talking about re women's reproductive rights? Didn't our mothers win that fight? Absolutely. I mean, the old battles have become new again. And I love what you said about um, having strategies and taking a, a playbook from our foremothers and forefathers, because right. they were um, they were immovable, and that's what we have to do. 
That's yeah. how we have to be. We have to be relentless. And we've got to know that we're on the right side. And I, and I say this, and I am, if nobody else told you, Congresswoman Sua, thank you. Thank you for uh, drafting the bill. Thank you for staying it. Thank you for being a voice. Thank you for continuing the legacy of the folks in Selma, Alabama. Thank you for representing me. I just want to say thank you. you know, but I also want to call people to action around. Part of the reason what got us here is because we disengaged y'all. Yeah. That we're part of the we're part of the responsibility of how we got here. The fact that every time we let an election go by, we say I'm not going to support it, I'm not going to vote in it. Someone actually took advantage of that and created something, power, and they leveraged that, right? And so I think it's really important for us to recognize that we all have a responsibility in doing this. And what can we do going forward? In addition to that, and not only I, I need you to call the senators and the representatives, but I need you to be engaged. Find a, a political home or find a way. You can write a letter to the editor. To write a letter to your editor, your local paper, right? Write a letter to your senator. If you're a writer, take the time and do that work. But also, we also have to have these conversations that are recentering this process that this isn't about politics. This is really about humanity. That at the end of the day, what is going to drive us? What was most important? The most, the most important thing that I think Dr. King taught us was not about the politics of the day. He really was trying to call the best out of us, our best selves, to really think at a way that how can we coexist in the world, that we can have different ideologies, we can have different positions, but that doesn't mean that I have to seek to destroy your humanity or try to take rights from you or undermine you. And so I am hoping that we also take a moment for us to recenter ourselves, that we do the work over this weekend, join a march. I'm quite sure wherever you are, there's a march happening somewhere. And I know in Alabama it is. Right? <laughs> take the moment to write a check, write a letter, write, um, uh, call your congressperson, um, your senator, but also take a moment to recommit and rededicate yourself that recognizing that if democracy is to be so, it will make us making it be so. Well, I couldn't have uh, had a more profound ending uh, than what you just said. Latasha Brown, I want to thank you. Um, you know, I, I know that my job uh, is made better when we have amazing activists and organizers and leaders like yourself that are willing to give of your time and talents to organize and mobilize and inspire this generation and future generations to get engaged. Because as you said, this is our this is our watch. This is happening real time during our lifetime. That's and right. if we are we are the beneficiaries of what happened before and we owe it to them. Right. It's not enough to say you stand on shoulders. It, we owe it to them to see what we're gonna do. How are we gonna take a step forward? And we should not be deterred even uh, by the fact that these senators are saying now that they're not going to change a procedural rule in order for us to be able to have um, the full protections of the Voting Rights Act restored. Um, we have to not be discouraged. We can right. be sad, we can be frustrated, That's right. but it should make us mad and it should make us want to do more. Right. And so as Latasha said, I hope that you will call your senators and below is the number to call the Senate, 202-224-3121. We want you, if you're a writer, to write letters to your senators and to Senator Manchin and to Senator Sinema. Look, the most important people for them to hear from are the people from their state. So if you have friends in West Virginia, friends in Arizona, make have them call. Like, like we've got to make sure that we're putting the pressure on. And as Latasha said, we can't let the Republicans off the hook. So Senator no. Shelby needs to hear from you. That's Senator right. Tupperville needs to hear from you. That's right. And the third thing is, let us join in with these wonderful coalitions um, that are on the ground. Join an organization, participate in a, 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 in, in a, in a march. Um, do more than just thank uh, you know, Martin Luther King um, for his sacrifice. Let's make this truly a day of action and we actually uh, do something about it. Um, Latasha, thank you so much. Do you have any parting words for us? I just want to say to my constituents, you know, it's my high honor to represent you in Washington, but I need you to represent our communities um, to these insurgents, frankly, people who really, who say that they uh, believe in democracy, but seek to take our voices away from us. Let us amplify each other's voice and work together to make it happen. Latasha. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I will say is I was, uh, well, the first thing I did right 
was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on. Y'all, when we work together, we win. We will win. Thank you. We're holding on. Thank you.